Well, thank you for joining us for Almost Persuaded. My name is Alan Hall. I'm the pastor of Good News Free Will Baptist Church here in York, Pennsylvania. If you have your Bibles today, if you'll go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, we'll be reading down through verse 5 in just a few moments, starting in verse 1. But I'd like to speak to you today on the subject of the power of prayer. The power of prayer. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing this message of how people will turn to all kinds of different things uh, as they are facing crisis in their life or uh, troubles or problems come their way or, or just that they're looking for help. Uh, they'll turn to all kinds of, of things, uh, places that really they shouldn't go to, I guess. Uh, pe you know, people will try drugs. They'll try alcohol to, to run from their problems. Uh, they'll try seeking advice from this old world to uh, how to handle their problems. Uh, some will even try religion to, to get some type of quick fix uh, for their problems. I even heard about a psychiatric hotline uh, that you can call to get help. Um, what happens when you call this uh, hotline, uh, a voice uh, comes on the other end of the line, and, and this is what you'll hear. It says, Welcome to the psychiatric hotline. If you are obsessive compulsive, repeatedly press 1. <laughs> if you are codependent, ask someone to press 2. If you are, uh, well, if you have multiple personalities, press 3 and four and five. Uh, if you're suffering from paranoia, uh, we know who you are and what you want. And if you'll stay on the line until we can trace this call, it would be helpful. If you are a schizophrenic, listen carefully and a little voice will tell you which number to press. And then if you're depressed, uh, push any button you wish. It won't make any difference anyhow. Thank you so much for calling. Well, it doesn't sound like you can get a whole lot of help from calling that uh, hotline, does it? Well, let me give you a number that you can call uh, when you need help. And uh, it's found in Jeremiah 33, 3. This is what it says. God said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, here, here's the good news. When you call God, you never get a busy signal. When you call on God, you never get an answering machine. You never get put on hold. Uh, you never, never have to do with the call, deal with the call waiting or anything like that. When you call on God, He promises in that verse that He will answer you. You know, there may be some serious issues in your life today, and you just don't know how you're going to handle those issues. Well, let me encourage you, call on God and He'll answer. Uh, you may have uh, things that are weighing you down. You might have marital problems or physical problems or financial problems or problems with your kids or job-related problems, even personal problems that nobody knows about but you. And you feel like that there's not a living soul on this whole earth that you can share your true feelings about those problems with. Well, you know what? You can call on God and know that not only will He listen, but He understands. And even greater news than that, He can do something about those problems and those situations that you're facing. Whatever crisis, whatever the burden may be, He can help. Now, here's, a, here's the problem sometimes. We want help, but when we get help, we don't want to let, release uh, those problems. In other words, we don't want to let go. I heard about a man who was walking down a road uh, years ago and he was carrying a big heavy backpack on his shoulders and a wagon came along and the driver kindly offered uh, this man a ride and of course the man climbed aboard. He was happy to get the ride. He was tired. And, uh, but even after he was seated on the wagon, he wouldn't take this burden off his shoulders, this big backpack. And, and the driver of the wagon couldn't understand, and he said, Sir, why don't you put down your burden? There's plenty of room. And the man said, Oh, no. He said, I, I feel it's almost too much to ask you to carry me. I wouldn't think of asking you to carry my burden also. You know, you uh, may be just like that man. You know, you've allowed Jesus to carry you. I mean, He's your personal Lord and Savior, but you're unwilling to trust Him with certain areas of your life. Jesus wants to control all of our life, though. 
He doesn't want us in parts. He wants us as a whole. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know, the best thing in the world that you and I can do when we don't know what to do is to turn to Jesus in prayer and ask Him to help us. And, and let me just remind you of this. You know, you're not the only one that can pray for your situation. If you're saved today, you're a child of God, then you have a family to help you. You are a part of the family of God. And you've got brothers and sisters that would love to help you pray about a certain situation. And you know what? You don't have to tell them all the, the, the details of what's going on in your life. Maybe just share with them, you know, there's something going on. Could you help me pray about this? There's something bothering me. Could you help me pray about this? And let them use one of the greatest benefits God ever gave us, that privilege of prayer. And then sit back and watch God work and notice the power through prayer. You know, in our text before us today in Acts chapter 12, we see that the Christians here in Jerusalem, they were facing problems. I mean, their, they, their situation was definitely a crisis. Uh, and the way that they dealt with this situation here serves as a reminder of what we must do when we're also faced with such times. I want us to read the first couple of verses here. Acts chapter 12, just read along with me. It says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quintillions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now the story begins here in chapter 12 with a man by the name of King Herod. Uh, he initiated a persecution wave that went throughout the church at that time. Now, the name Herod was a very popular name during New Testament times. Matter of fact, there are at least four different Herods mentioned in the Gospel and, and also in the book of Acts. Uh, Herod number one was known as Herod the Great. He was the Herod that uh, if you've studied uh, biblical history, he's the one that slaughtered all the babies in Bethlehem uh, trying to kill Jesus uh, when he was born. Uh, he's also murdered many of his own family. Herod number two was known as Herod Antipas. Uh, he was the Herod who commanded John the Baptist to, to be beheaded. And, and then he was also the Herod who was the ruler when Jesus was crucified. Herod number three was known as Herod Philip II. Uh, he was murdered by his own father because his father thought uh, that his son was trying to take the throne away from him. So he killed his own son. But before this Herod died, he had a son, Herod number four. And Herod number four was known as Herod Agrippa, who was the King Herod that we read about here in chapter 12 in Acts. Now, this Herod number four was a typical politician. Basically, uh, he did everything that he could to earn the favor of the people. He wanted to be liked, and he was always trying to do something good for them, something to impress uh, them. And, and so he did these things, again, not because he loved the people, but because he was trying to earn uh, popularity points with them. And so uh, one of the things that he did during that time was to persecute the church and its leaders. And, and that made the Jewish leaders very happy. You remember the Jewish leaders were the ones that crucified, uh, had Jesus crucified. And so uh, this made them very happy. And so the, every time Herod would do something, it would make his popularity points go up. One of the things that this chapter tells us uh, that he did as far as persecution was when he had a bunch of the Christians brought in, he found that one of them's name was James. Now, this was the James that was a part of the inner circle 
Peter, James, and John. James was the brother of John. You remember, they were known as the sons of thunder. Uh, James, uh, when Herod found out about him, was killed with the sword, these verses tell us. And of course, this had the effect that Herod wanted. His popularity rating soared during that time. And so he thought, wow, if this worked then, then I can take another one of the Christian leaders and that'll make me even more popular. And so he brought in Peter. Peter was well known during that time. Peter was the leader of the church at Jerusalem. And he brought in Peter with every intention of killing Peter right, right away. But he couldn't do it because these verses tell us that it was the time of Passover. And during the time of Passover, Jewish law said no criminal could be tried or prosecuted, found guilty, or killed during this week. And so he had to wait till after Easter in order to kill Peter. Uh, because if he'd have killed Peter, of course, he'd have lost the popularity points that he had gotten in the first place by having him come in. And so he waits. And Peter waits. Until the time that Peter's killed, Peter waits there in uh, prison under heavy guard. The scripture tells us that not only was he in prison, but he also had four soldiers assigned to him at one time. Um, two of the soldiers were chained to Peter. Uh, normally during that time, uh, a prisoner, his right hand, his dominant hand, was chained to the one of the soldiers' left hand. And everywhere he went, he was chained to that soldier. In Peter's case, it says here that he had on, on his right hand a soldier and his left hand a soldier. Not only did he have these two soldiers chained to him, but he had a soldier that was waiting outside his prison cell door. Then he had another soldier that was commissioned to stand outside the main gate or the prison gate door. Now I would say that was a pretty heavy guard for one old fisherman, wouldn't you? But you see, I think Herod had heard about what had taken place in Acts chapter 5. Way back in Acts chapter 5, you read about it there. Some apostles and Peter was taken captive. They were put in prison and they were let go in the middle of the night, supposedly by an angel. At least that was the story that was told during that time. And of course, we know that's what happened because that's what the Bible records for us. But they were set free. And Herod was determined, this is not going to happen with Peter. This is not going to happen on my watch. And so he had the extra security brought in to keep this from happening. Now, so what you have here is a big problem, don't you? Uh, you have a big crisis, an impossible situation. But let me show you the turning point of the entire story. Look back in verse 5. It says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. You see that one little word? there, but. That's the turning point of the entire passage. You see, Peter's in prison. It's the night before his trial. He's going to be executed the next day. He can't get out. He can't be freed by his friends and family and the church family that he has. It's a big major problem, but a turning point. You remember Herod here. Herod had limitless power, didn't he? He had the Roman Empire on his side. I mean, he could, you know, kill Christians right and left if he wanted to. Limitless power, it would seem. The church, on the other hand, meek, mild, unarmed, seemingly powerless. On one hand, you have Herod, who had just killed James. The church had witnessed it. Can you imagine the anguish that they felt when their leader, James, died? This is weighing heavy on their mind. And now things have gotten even worse. Peter, their leader, the, the, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, looks like he's going to die as well. He's in prison. He's chained to these guards. But Herod's in charge, it looks like. But <laughs> some things are working behind the scenes that people are not even aware of. There's a group of Christians praying behind closed doors for Peter's release. But... The power of God will prevail. But what? Prayers are being uttered by the church for Peter in this situation. The early church believed in the power of prayer. T.W. Hunt, the author of the book called Prayer Life, said this, If we examine the expansion of the church and the book of Acts and the epistles, 
we see convincing proof of the power of prayer. The early church had innumerable obstacles. Christianity was unknown, and it was opposed by the authorities wherever it spread. It suffered constantly from false accusations and rumors. But by the end of the first century, it had spread in exactly the geographic pattern commissioned by Jesus, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. This rapid geographical and ideological shift could have been accomplished only by supernatural forces. The instrument of expansion was the church, and the force the church was using was prayer. The early church didn't pray because it was the thing to do. You know, so many times we'll, we'll fall into that habit, won't we? We'll pray because it's the time to pray. You know, it's time for church to start. Let's pray. It's time to take up the offering. Let's pray. It's time to dismiss church. Or it's time to eat a meal. It's time to pray. It's time to go to bed. It's time to pray. Well, we get into that habit, and there's nothing wrong with establishing good habits of prayer. But if that's the only reason that we're praying, then we're missing the whole point. You see, the early church didn't pray repetitious prayers or monotonous prayers or meaningless prayers. No, when they prayed, their aim was to get a hold of God's attention. You know, that ought to be our aim as well. When we pray, God, I want your attention. I, I want you to listen to me right now. I, I want you to hear about what's going on in my life. God, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. I want to tell you how much I love you. I want to adore you. I want to praise you. That's why we pray, to get God's attention. Notice in our text it says that prayer was made without ceasing. That means that they were fervent in their prayers. The Greek adverb that is used there is ectonese. It's a medical term that describes the muscle being stretched to its absolute point. It can't be stretched any further. Um, it, it, it's almost at that breaking point. It's the same word that's used to describe Jesus when He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. There it says, And being in agony, He prayed more earnestly, and His sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I'd say that was some pretty earnest prayer, wouldn't you? You know, the church in our text, they basically poured their maximum effort as what they were capable of into their prayers for Peter. They knew the truth of what James wrote later on. It's a different James, but James said this. He said, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do you believe that? Do you believe that if you earnestly pour your heart out to God that He actually listens? That He actually knows what you're saying? He understands it? He can empathize? He can sympathize? And then He can do something about it? Hey, when was the last time you earnestly prayed about someone or about something? When was the last time you put your whole heart into your prayer? Again, not just praying just to get through it, not just praying because I'm supposed to be praying, but really put your all into what you were praying about. You might say, well, Pastor, I, I, I prayed about so-and-so, and, -so and uh, I, I prayed about them so much that I just feel like God gets tired of hearing it. You know, God knows what I want before I even pray it, and then God's got to get tired of hearing it. Well, I heard about a, a little five-year-old little boy who, who told his daddy that he wanted a baby brother. And uh, he not only told his dad that, but he told his dad he was willing to help any way that he could. And uh, his dad, who, who already knew that his wife was going to be having a, uh, a baby pretty soon, um, and so he used this as a teachable moment in his son's life. And so he says to his son, he said, I'll tell you what, you pray every day for two months for a baby brother. And if you pray with all your heart every day for two months, he said, I guarantee you God will answer your prayer and you'll get a baby brother. And so the little boy, he, he believed what his dad said. And so he took off to his room immediately. It wasn't even time to go to bed or you know say his night prayers or anything like that. He, he got down beside of his bed and he began to pray. 
praying for a baby brother. And he did that every single day for a month. And after a month went by, he kind of started doubting a little bit. He started questioning whether or not this was true. I mean, could he actually pray to God and then God would answer that prayer request of giving him a baby brother? And so he, he went around his neighborhood and he asked the neighborhood kids. And, and, and then he went and he talked to the kids at school and he found out that not one other kid that he talked to had ever heard of anything like this happening before. I mean, to actually ask God for a baby brother and then whammo, poof, there's a baby brother. It just, that just didn't happen. And so the little boy just quit. He quit praying. And so another month went by, and sure enough, Mama went to the hospital. And uh, so the dad went and got his son, and he brought him into the, the uh, hospital room. And the little boy walked in very cautiously. And he saw his mama laying over on the bed. And his mama lowered the sheet there. And there laying beside her was not one little baby brother, but two baby brothers. She had had twins. And the little boy's dad looked at the, the little boy, and of course he had the surprised look on his face. He just couldn't believe it that he not only got one baby brother, but two. And his dad said, Now son, aren't you glad that you prayed for a baby brother? And the little boy thought about it for a minute, and he said, Yeah, I'm glad, but aren't you glad I quit praying when I did? <laughs> well, prayer is a powerful thing. But we don't have to worry about praying too much. Uh, none of us ever have to worry about that. God always wants to hear us when we pray. And He's always, you know, He's never going to turn us away. He never gets tired of listen, listening to His children uh, talk to Him. You know, Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. That word ask there means to ask and ask and ask and keep on asking. Never stop asking. That's what that word means. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek. Again, that word seek is the same tense. Seek. Keep on seeking and you shall find. Knock. Same kind of tense. Keep on knocking and it shall be open unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. You know, when we look at a situation like uh, Peter's situation, we might be tempted to think, you know, what's the use of praying? I mean, you might be in a situation like that right now. You know, what's the use of praying about what I'm going through? What's the use? I mean, God's not going to do anything about what's going on. I mean, nothing can be done. I mean, I've tried my hardest. I've given my all. I've asked others for advice. I can't figure it out. I mean, you're at your wit's end. You're at the end of your rope. There's no way of escape. There's no solution. There's no way to be set free. It's hopeless. It's impossible. But you see, that's where faith comes in, doesn't it? Faith in our prayers is a necessity. You see, the early church obviously had faith because they were praying. They were praying for Peter's release. They believed God could do it. Peter obviously had faith because if you read on in these verses, uh, in verse 7 it tells us, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, while Peter was in prison, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Uh, we find in verse 6, why did the angel have to kind of nudge him on the side of the, uh, uh, on his side there? Because he was asleep. I'd say Peter had a lot of faith, wouldn't you? I mean, the night before his execution, the night that he was going to be killed, you know what I think Peter did? He put it all in the hands of Jesus. And he said, you know what? I can't get out of these chains on my own. I can't walk out of here and these guards all around me. I can't go out of these prison doors. I can't do this. But Jesus, you can. It's not going to do me any good to keep on worrying, keep on fretting, keep on getting stressed out about this. I'm going to just lay it in your hands, Jesus. I'm going to put it at your feet and let you handle and and of course he goes off to sleep <laughs> pretty amazing faith is the key faith says i'm tired of worrying 
I'm tired of my stomach getting all in, in, in knots. I'm, I'm tired of, you know, uh, using all the Zantac and all the anti-acids. And, and, and I'm tired of, of just going through life stressed out all the time. I'm looking for the peace that passeth all understanding. I'm looking for the peace of saying everything's going to be all right. That's what Peter had. And the only way Peter got this was because of prayer. He had prayed. He had asked God to work these things out. He believed in what God can do. Faith says, God, I can't, but you can. You can do this. What are your worries today? What are your problems? What are you going through? What, what has you all stressed out? What keeps you from getting a good night's sleep? By the way, when's the last time you had a good night's sleep? The answer to finding the peace that you're looking for is not in a bar. It's not in a drugstore. It's not in trying to figure out everything on your own or look into this old world for the worldly wisdom it has. You're not going to find any answers there. No, the peace that you're looking for only comes from prayer. From prayer. Now, what is prayer? Prayer is a great benefit that God's given to us. You say, I don't know how to pray. You know, I don't know what to say. Prayer is like Jesus sitting down across the table from you, just like I'm talking to you right now, and having a conversation with Him. In other words, you don't have to use all the these and the thous, you know, that the biblical language has. No, it's just having a conversation with Him. And you know, you, you, you tell Jesus your problems, you tell Jesus what's going on in your life, you discuss these things out with Him, but then it's all important that you don't leave out the other half of prayer. You see, the first half of prayer is you doing all the talking. The second half of prayer is letting Jesus do the talking and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to give you the understanding, to give you the wisdom, the reassurance, the peace that you're looking for. You see, so many times we bow our heads and we pray and we get off you know, off of our chest what we want to say, but then we never stick around long enough to let God say what He wants to say. Prayer is so important because it allows us to let God intervene into our life. Do you have any areas in your life that you need God to intervene in? Why not take them to Him in prayer today? Why not, as soon as this program's over today, bow your head, find a place that's quiet, get along with God, and say, God, just let me pour my heart out to you. I believe in you, God. I have faith in you. I have confidence in you. I put my trust in you. The Bible says to trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Why not let God do that in your life today? Let Him work things out instead of you stressing out over those things. Has worrying ever got you anywhere? No. Nope. But I guarantee you, you lay your problems, your stressed out points, the things that's got you all in knots at Jesus' feet, and He can do something miraculous in your life. Why? Because there's power in prayer. Take advantage of that today. There's power in prayer.